Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, so uh, I've been agonizing about exactly what to present in this talk because of I'm not, it's not a typical audience that I give talks to. So most of what I'll talk about here is very old, by which I mean 20, 25 years old, that kind of thing. Um, but what I'll try to convince you towards the end is that it, all the things that I speak about here are of current interest, and I'll mention why they're of current interest, but I won't actually get into the details of why they've become of current interest. And we could talk about those later over tea or whatever you like. Um, okay, so, and I should say, this won't be very mathematical, and, it, uh, and many of you may know a lot of the things that are in here. So if I insult your intelligence, just blame Randy for telling me to pitch it at the wrong level. <laughs> so, so I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about cosmology and particle physics. And here I really will insult your intelligence, because I really just want to set the scene about why and what I really mean when I talk about cosmology, what I mean about when I talk about particle physics. And because it's going to be important here when I get to talking about topological defects. So I'll give you the standard overview of what I mean by defects and why they uh, might be important uh, in the context of particle theories in an expanding universe. Uh, I'll talk about how you, they're classified, how they might be formed, uh, and a little bit about their dynamics. And I'll give you examples of what I mean by topological defects. And then in here I'll talk about something, many of the things you might think of with topological defects are, are important in the same ways in which they're important in material systems. And, and you've heard a lot about those in other talks. And I went to the nice talk that Gareth gave at Penn, uh, one of the previous workshops. But these things here are very specific things that you don't see in materials. They're to do with the gravitational effects of defects. So I'll spend a little bit of time on those. In particular, I'll talk about the space time around defects. And in particular, the effects defects can have due to their gravitational effects when they move. And I'll talk about their effects on the microwave background in particular and about gravitational radiation, which is a way in which defects can lose energy in the context of cosmology, which you wouldn't normally think of in the context of defects in materials. And at the end here, I'll talk a little bit about microphysical effects, cusps, superconducting strings, things like that, but just, just sort of loosely in order to set up really, hopefully, questions that we could talk about later. Okay, so I'm going to start off incredibly simply, and to remind, since it's, I'm not quite sure what areas everyone in the audience is coming from. So I want to remind you about general relativity because I'm going to talk about cosmology. So just to really insult you, general relativity is a theory that tells us how to associate a metric, since it's an audience of mathematicians, I think I can speak about that, um, to a particular distribution of mass and energy in the universe. So I throw down some meta distribution. General relativity gives me a bunch of differential equations that I then solve, and it spits out the metric. And in general relativity, that's the point. This is the thing that tells you that the matter now moves in the space-time manifold along geodesics of this metric. So once you solve the Einstein equations, it's all just differential geometry. So that's where uh, your guys' expertise takes over from mine, that's for sure. However, if you apply general relativity cosmology, the system of differential equations that uh, you saw on the last slide simplify incredibly, at least at the level where you talk about the background cosmology of the universe. Because since the universe on large scales we think is homogeneous and isotropic, the metric really, I'm ignoring issues to do with spatial flatness in the universe here, it really just comes down to knowing a single function, A of t. And A of t is the thing that tells you relative distances at different times. So if you've got a couple of points in the universe at different coordinate points at a given time, and their distance is given by t, and that distance changes as time goes on, as A of t changes as time goes on. And that's really all there is to cosmology when you're talking about the background. And it's general relativity that tells you what this function is given a distribution of matter in the universe. Okay? And the expansion rate, how AFT changes, depends on how much matter, radiation, whatever weird things are out there like dark matter are in the universe. Okay, so that's sort of, uh, sort of background what the metric means. So let's do some very simple cosmology. Those equations applied to the metric I wrote on the last slide with an assumption about the kinds of matter that are in the universe, namely that they be a perfect fluid with energy density and pressure, take a very simple form. There's a form called the Friedman equation that tells you basically how quickly the universe is expanding, and that's governed by just the total energy density of the universe. And then there's a question about how that's changing in time, and that's given by this particular combination of the energy density and pressure. So I tell you this very simple fact for two reasons. Later on, in quite a while, I'm going to come back and tell you something about the way in which defect networks themselves can affect these equations. And also because I want to talk about the effect that the actual expansion has on what happens in particle theories. So typically, we parameterize different matter by equations of state in this way. And if you have a type of matter that dominates the universe with an equation, a constant equation of state w, then you can just solve these equations trivially. The universe grows in time. That's what we mean by the expanding universe. 
and the energy density in whatever stuff is in the universe dies off as a function of the scale factor. So that's a very simple setup. So if the things in the universe are just gravitating blobs that have no other interactions, dust, then the energy density in them just dies off as the volume increases. If it's a gas of light, photons, then the energy dies off faster because photons redshift. Okay. So this is all of cosmology for my purposes here. So now let's switch gears and talk about a little bit of particle physics. So when particle physicists speak about particles, what do they really mean? So you take a theory of particle physics, namely a Lagrangian of a field theory, and what you typically do if you're an honest-to-goodness card-carrying particle physicist, by which I mean you care about going to colliders, smashing things together, looking at what comes out the other end, is you care about the perturbative spectrum of the theory. So you look at the, you take, for example, the Lagrangian for a scalar field, and here I've written it with a mass term and a phi to the fourth interaction. You look at the potential that comes out of that. You minimize the potential. You stick the field there, and in this case, the field takes its value at zero. You expand around that in small perturbations, and you expand out the action. And in doing so, you then figure out what the perturbative interactions of the theory are. And as long as it's really a perturbative theory, namely the couplings are small, then this is a, there's a well-defined expansion you can do. And if you want to understand what happens at colliders for a theory like this that's weakly coupled, you can then easily figure it out within this per perturbative regime. That's very simple particle physics. Now, as we all know, there are more complicated things that can happen in field theories even within the perturbative regime. So for example, if I just take this Lagrangian and flip the sign of the mass term, then it's still the same kind of Lagrangian, but the potential that it obeys is now one of these, so you call this a double well potential, and the field takes an expectation value, V. So this is no longer a stable point, it's an unstable point. The field takes an expectation value. And now if you're a collider physicist, you're someone who cares about the physics of particles, you say, well, I don't really care about all this complicated structure of this. I'll just go put my field there and expand around that in small fluctuations. And now I'll get a Lagrangian for the small fluctuations. And I'll do quantum field theory about the small fluctuations. And that'll tell me what kind of things will happen in my theory. I smash particles together, how many come out, with what probabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all perturbative quantum field theory. This is an example of a non-spontaneously broken one. And language I'll use again in a few slides. This one is spontaneously broken. But if you're a particle physicist, the way you do, you approach these is very much the same. You write the Lagrangian for this new field. In this case, it's trivial. The symmetry of the overall Lagrangian is no longer manifest because you've broken it in this case. It's spontaneously broken. But who cares because you're just going to do perturbation theory. Now, just an example of this is the electroweak theory. So electroweak theory is the theory of the uh, weak and electromagnetic interactions unified together. So it's a spontaneously broken quantum field theory built on SU2 cross U1 gauge groups. And it has a Lagrangian that consists of uh, gauge fields. These are the U1 gauge fields. These are the SU2 gauge fields. It has a bunch of fermions, the electrons and other such things that are the matter of the theory. And it has a potential for this scalar field phi, which is what we call the Higgs field. And the structure of the theory, so these field strength tensors are given here. One's an abelian one, one's not abelian. And here's this covariant derivative. And the whole point of this Lagrangian is that this potential is chosen in such a way as to have the symmetry breaking form that I spoke of. And then when the Higgs field takes, which is a complex doublet here, just to be clear, I'll, that'll be important for something I want to say in a while. It's a doublet of complex scalar fields. When that takes its minimum, then you expand out this theory around the minimum. It's spontaneously broken. The gauge fields get masses. The fermions get masses. And all the low energy interactions that we find in colliders today are accurately described basically to perfection within current experimental bounds by this Lagrangian. So it's very, very successful. Okay. So I want to have this on the screen because I'm going to come back to it in a while. So topological defects have their origins in the structure of physics at the very smallest scales, for my purposes here. Obviously, you've heard other examples. As described by the field theories that I've been writing down in the last few slides. But the way they're realized in nature, we hope, is through the evolution of the universe at very early times. So I want to describe how that might work. So here's this sort of standard picture you often see particle physicists write down. At low energies in the universe, you've got magnetism and electricity. 
unified together into electromagnetism. You've got the weak force and the strong nuclear force. We know that the U1 theory that describes electromagnetism is unified, and the SU3 theory that describes the nuclear force are described by massless fields in the universe today. This unifies with the weak theory into this theory I described on the last slide, an SU2 cross U1 electroweak theory at around 100 GeV in the universe. And this SU3 keeps going, and there's a hope that at even higher energies in the universe, these all combine together in what gets called the grand unified theory. And if that was true, then it would be described by some gauge group G, but it certainly doesn't have to be this way. And in fact, all we really know about particle physics today is described on the last slide the standard model of particle physics. And so in principle, there could be a whole set of breakings in the universe that start off with some presumably large, simple gauge group that gets broken in the way that I described in the spontaneous symmetry breaking down to smaller and smaller groups, eventually hitting the nuclear force and the electroweak force, and finally breaking to just electromagnetism and the strong force I should have written at the end here. So this is what people uh, think might happen above the electroweak scale, which is as far as we've been able to test. That's right, that's right. So the, the purpose here is to unify this into a single gauge group G, such so that all the, the way in which the different way in which the way in which these forces manifest themselves in different ways is a consequence of the breaking of this gauge group. Right. So it's supposed to be a unification. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Now I talked about what people do in colliders when they go and try to probe these, these uh, particle theories. So what is it that they're actually doing? Well, in colliders, you probe the symmetry by going to high energies. You pump enough energy into the particles that you start to understand that the way the theory can behave in its symmetric phase. In the universe, it turns out that high temperatures can play exactly the same role. So the way in which that works is that, as I try to show you, the universe is expanding, which is something you know. In the past, therefore, the universe was smaller. And because it was smaller, the temperature was higher. And the average energy of particles increases. And as we'll see in a moment, a consequence of that is that the symmetry of these theories, these spontaneously broken theories, will restore at high temperatures. Okay. So the point is that if that's the case, then as the universe cools, running the clock forward in the universe, then what you expect is that a restored symmetry will ultimately break due to the cooling of the universe and the development of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And phase transitions will take place. And in particular, as I'll talk about in a few slides, some of those phase transitions will be first order. They'll proceed by the nucleation of bubbles. They'll be quite violent events. And as we'll see, this is how topological defects may manifest themselves as the universe evolves. OK, so let's move on to what I mean about topological defects. I talked about the perturbative behavior of gauge theories. Let's just jump in with some examples of what these defects are and see how they differ from the normal perturbative structure of gauge theories. So to start with, I'm just going to discuss what I call global defects. So let's just write down a simple Lagrangian of the type I wrote down on the last slide. This is n scalar fields, just coupled together, and with a symmetry breaking potential. So if I have a structure like this, then the theory is spontaneously broken. The Lagrangian here is invariant under an O-N symmetry, but the vacua are where the modulus of phi squared becomes V squared. And any vacuum configuration, therefore, that where this is realized is invariant only under O n minus 1. So the vacuum of the theory is an O n minus 1. Okay. Oops. So if you do perturbation theory, as I said, around any vacuum like that, you'll get the same perturbative spectrum. Your collider phenomenology doesn't care about any of this nice structure. But suppose that you don't do perturbation theory. That's what we want to ask here. And if you don't do perturbation theory, interesting things can happen. So the first interesting thing that can happen is they can get domain walls. So let's take an example where I only choose one of those real fields that I wrote down on the last slide. So then the vacuum consists just of two points. It's topologically disconnected. And if we choose boundary conditions in your space, and in a moment we can go back and ask how this might be realized in the universe. I mean, after all, normally when you think about these things from a mathematical viewpoint, you just say, I will pick the boundary conditions and look for interesting solutions. But in the universe, we need to figure out why those, initial con those boundary conditions would be realized. But for now, let's choose boundary conditions such that phi goes to its different vacua as one direction in space goes off to plus or minus infinity. And then what you find is that any continuous field configuration can't be in vacuum everywhere. It has to pop out of the vacuum in some region of space. 
and the configuration that matters is a domain wall. And once you've set that up via these boundary conditions, so here's the profile, this is Z, although I've written X, and this is phi, so it just is a domain wall. Once you've set it up, there's no way for this to relax to the, inf to the vacuum, trivial vacuum, without an infinite energy cost. So an object like this, invisible to the perturbative spectrum of the theory, is uh, present in theories like this. Um, once you have it, there's no way to get away, to do away with it. And the reason it's stable is because of topology. Now, obviously this can be made more complicated. You go up to two fields, or if you like, one complex field. The vacuum's now a circle. It's topologically connected, but not simply connected. And if you choose boundary conditions of the right type, namely you allow the field to wind at infinity as you go around a circle in real space, then a continuous field configuration can no longer be in vacuum. It must be out of vacuum somewhere. And in this case, the vacuum config configuration you're left with is a cosmic string that, again, cannot relax to the vacuum. So this is your potential. What you got here, a cosmic string, as taken from the Star Trek episode where they interact with a cosmic string. I'm not sure you can see that very well here, but that's a string. That's the enterprise. That's all you need to know. Okay. So this also can't relax to the trivial vacuum without infinite energy. So again, I haven't told you how we're going to form these things in the universe, but if you form them, you're done. They're going to be around, and in principle, they just live forever. Now, these are the things, by the way, that I'm going to spend almost the whole talk talking about, for reasons that I'll try to make clear in a moment. So finally, well not quite finally, what about if I take three of these fields? Then I have my vacuum is a two-sphere. The topological structure is again a little more complicated, as we'll see on the next slide. But now, what is the vacuum field configuration that you set up with the right boundary conditions? Well, it's a monopole. It's a point-like object which has this hedgehog configuration. The field points everywhere in a different direction in three-dimensional space. And again, once it's set up, it, has, it cannot be relaxed to vacuum without costing you infinite energy. Basically because at infinity, you have to undo this winding, and that's an infinite amount of energy to reorient all those fields in a single direction. Okay, so those are three examples. There's a further example I'd like to give you, although it's not really an example of a topological defect. If I keep on this story of cranking up the number of fields I care about, then there's, I get to n equals four. And, and I should say, remind you, on the last few slides, I was dealing with global symmetries. This ON symmetry was a global symmetry. It was a rotation of all the fields uh, in the same way at all points in space-time. If I had done a rotation which changed from point to point in space, I would have a local theory, a gauge theory. And I'll write one of those down in a moment. But the story that I told about the formation of those defects and their dimensionality and everything else would go through just the same. This is different, though. If I do the same with four fields, the vacuum is now a three-sphere. And any continuous field configuration, it turns out it cannot be in vacuum everywhere at all times, is the right statement. I should have written that different here. So what does this mean? Well, if you have uh, four fields, it's possible to have the structure such that the field winds around. It consists of, it's in vacuum everywhere, but it consists entirely of gradient energy. So, if this is an inf so this is an example in one dimension, this is an example in two dimensions. The field is just winding around its vacuum manifold, staying in the vacuum manifold at all times, but there's gradient energy that's locked into the system. And in fact, if, this, if the space itself were topologically interesting, you could really wind this all the way around the space and it would just stop. If the space is infinite, then these things will unwind. So, these things get a name. They're called textures, uh, just because they look like a texture. But the point is that what these things do is they unwind and then where all these gradients will try to align, they'll do so in such a way that ultimately all the gradient energy will be piled up in one part in the space. And there'll be enough of that that the field will pop out of its vacuum at a point in time and undo the topology and then radiate the energy out to infinity. So these are not quite topological defects in the usual sense, but sometimes people talk about them in the same breath. Also, these things are strange because they only exist in global theories. If you try to create one of these structures in a gauge theory, then this entire structure is equivalent to a large gauge transformation. So it doesn't really exist at all. And I mention that particularly because in a while when I mention the electroweak theory again, I'm going to resurrect these briefly in one comment. Okay. So obviously there's a more formal theory that goes with this. And uh, this is the wrong audience for me to be telling you about it, but it's mandatory that I have it on a slide. Uh, 
So if I have a theory with a symmetry group G, and I don't care, as I said, whether it's local or global at this point, that's spontaneously broken to a subgroup, then if you construct the vacuum, what I'm going to call the vacuum manifold, but the set of, of cosets of H and G, then this is, this is the vacuum of the theory. And we're interested in the topological properties of the space. And in particular, you want to know if the homotopy groups are trivial or not. And in general, if you do this calculation in D space-time dimensions, then in D plus one space-time dimensions, then you have defects of dimension P if this homotopy group is non-trivial. So that's how you figure it out. So this is a very general statement. This just reduces, in the case of three dimensions, D equals three, so we're in three plus one, to the statement that if pi zero is non-trivial, you get domain walls. If pi one is non-trivial, you get cosmic strings. And if pi two is non-trivial, you get what I call magnetic monopoles. Okay. This is a sort of formal way to tell if a theory will give you the structure. So let me go back to the standard model for a moment. I told you the standard model is, there's the strong interactions, which don't really matter for what I have to say here. But there's a spontaneous symmetry breaking that goes on that takes SU2 cross U1 to U1. And if you compute the vacuum manifold of this, then I told you that the Higgs field that breaks this symmetry is a complex doublet. It's a complex doublet that takes a vacuum expectation value. So that's four, f that's four real fields, if you like, all of which have to square and equal a constant. And therefore, the vacuum manifold is isomorphic to a three-sphere. And the only thing a three-sphere has is a non-trivial third homotopy group. And therefore, since this group is a gauge group, there are no useful defects. The only chance you would have would be to have textures. And since it's a gauge theory, textures are equivalent to a, global, to a uh, large gauge transformation. So the standard model, the one spontaneously broken theory we know and have in hand, doesn't have topological defects as part of it. Now, there are two things to say about that. Well, there's more things, presumably, but I have two things to say about it. Which, three, I guess. The first thing is, I sort of lied to you ever so slightly about these textures. So I won't have anything more to say about this today, but even though these textures are equivalent to a large gauge transformation, it turns out that in the standard model, the coupling to fermions is anomalous. And so if you set up one of these large texture configurations, in its relaxation, in this large gauge transformation you would do, it turns out that that causes you to generate fermions in your theory. So I'm throwing this out there as a statement. I'm happy to come back to it in discussion later. But it turns out this is a very useful way of trying to generate the matter-antimatter symmetry of the universe. So people are even interested in this part of the gauge theories, of uh, topological defects, even though it's in a gauge theory. Another comment I'd like to make is that even though there are no topological defects in this theory, it turns out there can be interesting solutions that look just like topological defects. And the rough, these go under the heading of what are called embedded strings. And in the actual electroweak theory, they're unstable. But if you modify the electroweak theory slightly, it turns out you can make them stable. And the point of these objects is the following. The vacuum manifold is an S3. So let me picture it as an S2 because I can't picture an S3 in front of me. So if you imagine an, a U1 that is a subgroup of, S, of the S2 that is equatorial, then I could just set that U1 up as the curve in the vacuum space that I choose to set my fields at at infinity. In other words, I could choose to give my fields vacuum expectation values at infinity that allow me to have a string configuration. Now, all the statements I made about strings before said they were stable. Here, they're not. And the reason they're not is that that entire vacuum configuration can just slide off the top of the two-sphere and is topologically trivial. Does that make sense? But here, it turns out that in, in, because of the interplay between the uh, gradients in the gauge fields, it turns out that moving on the two-sphere costs you energy. And for the right values of parameters, it turns out there's a little energy barrier to, to relaxing that. And you can have defects in theories like this that are not topologically stable, but nevertheless are metastable because of this little barrier. It takes you energy to actually get over the barrier and topologically unwind these things. And such objects are called embedded strings. And in the electroweak model, they're unstable, but there are ways to sort of make them stable by adding little bits onto the electroweak theory. So again, something I won't have time to talk about here, but I'm happy to talk about later. Finally, any simple group that breaks to the standard model one will always be left with a U1 that's on its own, a separate U1 factor. And one thing you know about any breaking like that is that no matter how it happens, you will all, with that particular breaking that leads to this group, will always have a non-trivial um, uh, 
for a zeroth homotopy group. And therefore, you're guaranteed that if you have any group that's simple and breaks to the standard model, you will get monopoles. They will be allowed by that, that breaking. That's a very simple thing to show. And I just wanted to comment that that observation is one of the arguments behind the development of the theory of cosmological inflation. The fact that if you have a grand unified theory that breaks the standard model, no matter what you do, you're guaranteed that it will contain magnetic monopoles. And as I'll comment on a few slides, those can cause a huge problem for the universe. And you had to figure out a way to get rid of them. One of the things that Guth did in developing inflation was to figure out that the universe had to expand incredibly quickly at early times to sweep away these monopoles and make the universe free of them. Okay. So this is sort of cultural knowledge at the end here. If you like. So topological defects in cosmology have been discussed in, surprisingly have been discussed in connection with almost all cosmological phenomena that I know of. If there's a problem in the universe that we're seeking an answer to, somebody has tried to use topological defects to solve that problem, it turns out. They've been discussed in as a way to make inflation work. They've been discussed as a way to make the structure that we observe in the universe form, and I'll talk about that in a moment. They've been discussed as a way to make uh, the matter-antimatter asymmetry of the universe. In fact, this is something I've worked on myself, although I won't talk about it. They've been discussed as candidates for dark matter. They've been discussed as a way to make the universe accelerate. So you must have heard that the universe is getting bigger faster today. And it turns out the one way to do this, although not particularly well, is by using a network of defects. And I'll talk about that in a minute. They've been discussed as a way to get primordial magnetic fields. And I could go on and on and on. They've been very, very popular. Okay. So as I'll mention later, though, it is generally thought that for many of these purposes, they are ruled out now. And this is a plot of the microwave background power spectrum. And I'm going to come back in a few slides and explain, explain what's on here. But suffice it to say that it looks like strings on their own cannot play a significant role in the very earliest times in the universe. And I'll, I'll flesh that out in a few slides. Nevertheless, these objects, as I've tried to convince you, generically occur in field theories. And in many ways, it'd be quite surprising if they didn't exist in the universe. If there's any structure at all to our theories of particle physics above the standard model, it, it would be quite surprising if the symmetry breaking pattern was such that it didn't give you some kinds of defects in the universe. The only question is, well, not the only question, but the remaining question is, is it likely that you'd be able to actually experimentally verify that they're there? So how are they relevant to cosmology? So there are basically two broad categories of ways in which topological defects can affect the universe. One is their gravitational effects, and the other one is through their microphysical effects. So in the gravitational effects, there are really sort of two separate ways. One is if you compute the energy momentum tensor of these objects, and I'll do that simply for one simple example in a moment, then there, if you average over it, then they, the total number of defects makes a contribution to the stress energy tensor of the universe that affects the way the universe expands through the Einstein equations can affect the expansion rate of the universe. Another way is that the metric of an individual defect can leave imprints on the sky, either in the microwave background or in the images of astrophysical objects. And I'll show you how that happens in a moment. The microphysical effects are different and they're a little more subtle. Okay? It depends on being able to access the detailed structure of the defect core. After all, if these things form in a spontaneous symmetry breaking, what you're doing is you're taking a small region of the very early universe in its highly symmetric state, and you're preserving it in the core of a defect, while the rest of the universe attains its low energy state. So the microphysical effects of defects depend on being able to release or, or access that small region of the early universe that you have inside the core. And one way in which that can happen is through bursts of high-energy particles, I'll mention briefly at the end. Uh, it can be a method, as I said, to uh, seed baryogenesis, a way to make the universe have an excess of matter over antimatter. And as I'll mention very briefly, strings, it turns out, in their cores can carry supercurrents. And if they carry supercurrents, it can completely change the way in which defect networks evolve. And it can, it can make them either useful for cosmology or can constrain particle theories that admit such solutions. Okay. Now, for the rest of the talk, essentially, I'm going to focus on cosmic strings. And the reason is that other defects, if you imagine forming a lot of domain walls or a lot of monopoles, they will dominate the expansion history of the universe almost immediately. They're very heavy. They contribute a large amount to the average energy momentum over a Hubble size in the universe. And they very quickly will dominate the universe. For monopoles, this is what's meant by the monopole problem, as I mentioned earlier. For domain walls, the problem is even worse because they're, of course, extended and have a 
much bigger effect on the universe. So I'm going to not discuss those for the rest of the talk, although there are, of course, ways in which they can play a useful role in the universe. Uh, I'm going to discuss strings. And there are a number of ways in which strings can be created. They can be created through phase transitions. They can be created um, uh, through inflation itself. They can be created in higher dimensional realizations of the universe where brains collide. And they can be created within string theory where uh, um, phase transitions can give rise to a particular type of stringy cosmic strings. And maybe in the last slide of what I have to say, I'll return and mention that possibility at the end. Okay. So I want to focus on this first one, really, phase transitions. It's the best understood of these mechanisms. It requires a lot less extra extrapolation of our theories. After all, we know that the standard model is described by a quantum field theory. And we know that that should be at finite temperature at some point. So it's not a huge extrapolation to ask, what would it be like to have a little more gauge structure tacked onto that theory? And I'll mostly discuss what are called abelian strings, namely where the group that forms the strings is an abelian group, or U1, essentially. And I'll make some comments about non-abelian strings later, because they can be quite interesting in their own right. So the standard thing that people like to use is the abelian Higgs model. You take a simple U1 gauge field, you have a complex scalar phi, and you break the symmetry with that symmetry breaking potential that I wrote down earlier. And you look for static finite energy, finite energy density solutions with cosmic string boundary conditions. So your field phi depends only on radial distance and angle from the core of the string. The gauge field must become pure gauge at infinity. And if you write these things down and you plug them back into the equations of motion arising from this Lagrangian, you get some simple ordinary differential equations for these profile functions f and g. The boundary conditions I've used here are such that as you go around a circle at infinity, the scalar field phi winds precisely once in the, in the, gauge, in the uh, vacuum manifold. If I put an n in here, it would wind n times. But it's enough for us to consider. One, yes? Are you going to explain how these cosmic uh, boundary conditions come in? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's very right. Why would the universe ever do this? Right, exactly. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to that. Yeah. OK. So you can solve these equations numerically. And so here, here they are. F and G. And as you might expect, you start off in false vacuum, phi equals 0, the unstable part of the, of the uh, potential. And you run off to the real vacuum at infinity. And so this is the profile of the core of the string. And it has a length scale associated with the scalar field and another length scale associated with the gauge field. Okay. So, if I set those up, what do I have? It turns out that, well, it's easy to calculate. There is only one mass scale in the problem. There's an energy mass per unit length of the string, this long string, which, is, which I'll call mu, which is essentially given by the vacuum expectation value of the field squared. It has a magnetic core width, the typical uh, distance it takes for that gauge field to reach half its, half its uh, vacuum value. That's given by the gauge coupling constant times the vacuum expectation value inverse. It has a scalar width that is given by the scalar coupling times V inverse. And it turns out that the string carries a total magnetic flux, which you can find by integrating the gauge field around a loop far away from the string. And that's given by some quantized amount. Uh, well, in this case, it's given by 2 pi over E, since it's a winding one string. So these are strings with magnetic flux in the core and a winding in phi. So the core consists of false vacuum. And as I said earlier, it's a small part of the early high energy universe that's preserved by the topology here. Now, coming to the question that, that you asked, why would you expect these things to form? So if you want to understand how what will happen, you, strictly speaking, should take the fields of the model that you have under consideration. You should do finite temperature quantum field theory with them, because the early universe is hot. And you should figure out what the vacuum is at high energy. And then you should follow the dynamics of the system through the phase transition as it breaks. So let's just mock this up here rather than doing the full calculation. So you can see quite easily what goes on. If I take for a moment, imagine that I take two scalar fields in my theory. So here's my string field or my wall field or whatever. Here's the potential I wrote down earlier. And I've just got a new field in the theory. And I've coupled the fields together. And I just want to imagine that this field chi is very light. And if it's very light, it will 
uh, become in thermal equilibrium very easily with the background temperature of the universe. And I can replace it in this Lagrangian by its expectation value t. Okay. This will be in good enough for the answer I want to get here, although, strictly speaking, you should just do the full finite temperature field theory. And if you do that, this potential here can be replaced by a finite temperature effective potential, which you've got strictly by integrating out this extra field chi. And it looks like this. It has mu in here that came out of the bare potential, lambda from the bare potential, but it also has a temperature dependent term. And because of the different signs of these two terms, you can see that there's a critical temperature here given by this, below which the theory is in its broken state and above which the theory is in its restored state. So that means there's an opportunity for a phase transition. Okay? So the full symmetry, symmetry is restored at high T, and only below this critical temperature is it broken. In the example I wrote on the last slide, the phase transition, and, and I've depicted here, is continuous, or if you like, second order, the phase transition. But in general theories, it's easy to generate uh, examples where the phase transition is first order, for example, and there's a barrier in the potential of the critical temperature. And those proceed by bubble nucleation, whereas these proceed essentially by spinel decomposition. So the point of this is just to say that if the universe gets hot at early times, which we know it does, then these symmetries will be restored, and then as it cools, the symmetries get broken. So nothing new there. I'll just put some sort of mathematics into what I said in words earlier. But then what will happen is the following. So just to sort of repeat slightly what I said, uh, the expectation value of the field will be given by this, but let me ignore this slide and go on. So now, as you go through the phase transition, the field will fall into different parts of different choices for its vacuum manifold in causally disconnected regions. So if you've got an example of a first order phase transition like this, bubbles will nucleate. Where those bubbles nucleate of the true vacuum, there'll be no connection between the actual vacuum value it takes. And because of that, there can be a winding in principle like that. And then as the phase transition goes on and completes, you'll end up with a system that has true vacuum, and you've automatically generated a winding in the field. So if, at the very least, causality on its own will tell you that, on average, you'll get one of these per causal horizon in the universe. And in fact, a more complicated calculation tells you that there's a competition in these models between the various correlation lengths in the theory that tell you you can predict, on average, how many you'll produce per unit volume. But this argument alone tells you that you should expect to produce them during a phase transition in the universe because light travels at a finite speed, essentially. It's a very big system. Now, given that you get these objects in the universe, how do they interact? So the way you describe the dynamics of strings is now to take a completely different point of view. I described how the strings form with a field theory. But it's very inefficient to try to understand how strings themselves behave by sticking with the field theory. Instead, you now idealize these things and say, well, they're described by the Nambu-Goto action. You say that the position of the string is where the Higgs field has a zero, and so basically treat it as a one-dimensional object that sweeps out a world sheet in time. And then the action for that one-dimensional object with its induced metric is just given by the area of the world sheet. And it just extremizes this area. That's what the string does. And that's an action that just tells you how a string itself will behave without taking into account any of the microphysical structure that I had in the field theory. It's just a one-dimensional object. So if you write this down, there are exact solutions to the equations of motion. There are left-moving and right-moving modes on the string. And it allows for the generic occurrence of what are called cusps, where the string will develop this kind of shape. And I'll come back to that in a moment. I just want to mention it here, but I'll mention it in more seriousness in a moment. And those are places that can be very important for the dynamics of the string. The string will move at the speed of light at these cusps. So I've got left and right moving modes on the string, waves, and generically they will form cusps as they interact. So these things don't have to occur, but gener generic interactions will generate them. In particular, as I'll mention on the next slide, if two strings meet, they will typically, and you might say, well, why should this happen? I'll show you why on the next slide. They will typically chop off, they will exchange partners, you know, it's called intercommutation, chop off loops, which will be very important for us, and leave behind cusps on the strings. So it can happen in Where through, yeah, so here and here, or there, if you like. So this is an example where two strings are interacting. This is an example where one string is self-interacting. So on 
In, right, good. So in the limit that I've chosen here, where I'm treating the strings as infinitesimally thin, it indeed has infinite curvature there. But in, rea in reality, it won't. And uh, they'll get smoothed out by the, by the finite size effects of the string. Right. But in this idealization, it really is a, 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 a discontinuity in the derivative there. Really. So what happens here? So suppose that you take two strings. It's sort of difficult to, to imagine what happens. You take two strings, you allow them to hit one another. How do you know what's going to happen? So you can actually study this. You can study this numerically. And people have put a lot of work into putting these things on a computer. So here's an example where you literally take two infinite strings that are a right angle in the abelian Higgs model, and you just let them hit one another. And you ask what happens. So there they go. There's one on top. One's coming into the board. One's coming out. And that's what they do. So it's kind of amazing, right? So let me I run that again. So again, you've got one string here, one string behind it. This one comes in, and then they, they hit one another comes in, and then this will join with that, and that joins with that, and they leave together behind a little bit of energy. So that picture at the end appears to be a string with ends, but that means it's a loop? Yeah, that, good, I'll come back to that. John? Yeah, that, that's, just, that's, that's, that's a loop. Uh, you can't really resolve it here. In fact, this thing, this happens so closely that it's essentially, the loop has already collapsed and allowed it to radiate its energy. But the important point is that, yeah, there's no, if you were to you know, draw a circle around this, there's no topology in here whatsoever. So it will just radiate away. Whereas these are actually honest to goodness strings, which have now exchanged partners. The, so let me, oops, oh, sorry about that. Too much stepping back and too much animation. So, so this thing comes in. And then you'll see this part of this string join with that one and go off. And that's what I mean by intercommutation. It's very cool. More complicated things can happen, okay? So, you know, you can have loops of strings that will be formed in this process of, of the phase transition. They themselves can, can join, and then when they can, you know, you can see what happens here. There's huge amounts of radiation. The thing itself settles down into a loop and eventually radiates out to infinity. There are very complicated things that can happen, and people love to study these things on computers, and they're pretty, so they're worth looking at. Say it again. Oh, it's a group. It's, it, is, it means GR, but not, there's no general relativity in this plot. It's, it's not GR for group. It's, it's the general relativity group at damped, right? So, that's, so, yeah. so there are lots of different interactions that can happen once you make these objects. The examples I gave you are very simple. The interaction of two strings, the interaction of two loops. But obviously, you'll form a whole network of these things, as we'll see in a moment. So once you go through the phase transition, it's very important to know how many of these things are around because I'm going to care how they affect the universe. So for abelian strings, because I've shown you that there's this intercommutation behavior, the network, and I'll show you what I mean by the network, will chop off loops all the time. Those loops will radiate away the way that you noticed in that uh, simulation. And the result, the nice thing about this is that when you chop off loops and they radiate away, they're taking energy out of the network of strings. And that means that this problem I mentioned to you earlier about monopoles and walls, them dominating the universe because they just sit there and hold a lot of energy, there's a potential to ameliorate that problem by losing energy from the string network in these radiated, this radiated out energy due to loops. And in fact, it turns out that for these abelian strings, the network reaches what's called a scaling solution. And what that means is that if you look at the distribution of loops in a given volume of the universe and you scale that volume of the universe by the expansion of the universe itself, it always looks the same. And because of that, the string network doesn't come to dominate the universe typically in these abelian models. And that means it can play a useful role in the universe without ever ruining what we know is a successful cosmic evolution history. So how do we know that? Well, what I showed you on the last slides are just examples of I literally make the initial conditions such that there are two strings in the configuration I want and let it go. But what you can do, of course, is just take a phase transition and let it happen. So this is your question from earlier. If I just do that and say, what happens? Then you can see what happens. So that's an initial random throwing down of the field. And it, you let the phase transition occur. Strings form. The network itself starts to form. All the place, you can see all these radiation happening as loops are formed and thrown off. And the network itself starts to straighten out. Loops are continually being formed and taking energy out of the system. And this, from simulations like this, is very easy to calculate. What is the total amount of energy in a system that's in these long strings that go through the whole volume and in the loops that themselves are always decaying away and throwing off energy? Which the red the red? Yeah, the, the, I think the, it's a good question. I think the color on this is 
energy, you know, what is it? I won't say it's energy density, but so the, I think the red, the red on this is where the loops are being chopped off the network. That's, what, that's what's going on. So it's, it's, radiating the it's radiating the energy away. Yeah, what I'm not so sure is what's going on with the blue, actually, but it might just be an artifact of, oh, you know what it is? The blue is a box. I, can, I couldn't see it from here, but the blue is a box. It's happening again. So yeah, the red is just where they're chopping off the loops. So once you know that these things are going to exist, you can start to ask questions that are sort of peculiar to the universe as opposed to materials. And the thing you'd like, to, one thing you'd like to ask is, what's the metric of a cosmic string? So I told you how general relativity works. So this is a distribution of mass and energy. What's its metric? So it's very simple to treat this, to figure this out in the limit that I was talking about a moment ago. To treat the string as an infinitely thin, completely straight delta function distribution that just lies along a single axis, then it turns out the energy momentum tensor is very, very simple. It has an energy density and a pressure that lies along the axis and nothing else. That's it. Very simple energy momentum tensor. Now, if you put this into Einstein's equations, look for cylindrical solutions, then it turns out that the metric is something that you know. It's the metric for Minkowski space written in cylindrical polar coordinates. Except this angle that I'm calling theta is not the angle you're used to thinking about. The angle I'm calling theta only runs from 0 to this much less than 2 pi. So it's a deficit angle that appears in here. G here is the Newton's constant, rho is the energy density. Okay. So the metric around a cosmic string, everywhere, if you were to do local experiments, you would have no knowledge that you had a cosmic string sitting in front of you. You wouldn't be attracted to it. There'd be no, nothing like that. Nevertheless, if you went around it, you did something more global, you'd find there was a deficit angle in your space. So the metric around a, it's a very strange thing. The metric around this is everywhere Minkowski, but has a deficit angle. And it's a conical space time, therefore. So if you look at the metric, what you've got is the string. This is what I was drawing on, what I was writing on the last side is a deficit angle. So if I connect those two sides, it's really a cone. And it turns out that can have very important effects. Not for you. You don't stand there and get attracted to it. But you do look at objects in the universe that could, in principle, be behind a string like this. And when you normally look at an object in the universe, the light from that object takes the geodesic path to you. If there's not too much curvature around, too much big, massive gravitational lensing going on. It just takes a path to your eye. But here, clearly, if I have a distant, here I am, and here's a quasar, there are more than one path around which the photon can go. And so generically, in a conical space-time, you expect there should be double images. So here's your saw, the string. Here's, say, some distant source, the quasar. It sends its light off in this direction and that direction. But the space-time is such that these two lines are identified. And therefore, you see the light coming to you from two different directions. Is that clear, that picture? So the point is that in a cosmic string space-time, you should see double images behind the string. Like that. So that's, this, is not a, this is not an actual, well, this is an actual picture of what was a candidate uh, object. It's been a little enhanced in the middle here, but this is actually a picture, I think, of CS, uh, CSL1, the cosmic string, a candidate for a cosmic string double lensing event, which is shown to not to be a real double lensing event. And I can tell you how you do that by following up images like this with the Hubble Space Telescope and noticing that the two objects you're seeing are morphologically different. But tell the difference between double lensing due to like a black hole in between versus a cosmic string or something. It, it, it works in a different way. So for a single black hole, you don't see anything. But you see lensing due to large distributions of dark matter or galaxies. And it's a different form of lensing. So for those, for those what you see are arcs on the sky, right? Because it's a point. It's basically a point-like di distortion of the field. Here you're seeing something different. It's line-like double images. I should tell you these have never been observed, so it's not something that we think is true. But if, if you do see something like this, it should be pretty clear, actually, because it should be double images like this. What about the photon space? Do you have a space? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Now, there's something else that can go on. I told you that you wouldn't feel the effect of a cosmic string if it's just sitting here. But if it's moving past you, 
turns out you do feel the effect of that, uh, that uh, conical spacetime. Basically, the effect is that the spacetime is conical and the sort of amount of the cone you're feeling is bigger as it's moving away from you. And so, what's going on is this. Suppose you've got the string. There's a light source here, an observer here, and a string is moving perpendicular to them. Then what happens is behind the string, things get blue shifted. If you like, the light for coming from there to there has less distance to go through because of the cone. Whereas the light in front, correspondingly, is getting red shifted. It's got further to go. Basically, you're seeing different paths of the photons as they go around the object. And so what this means is that as well as having the opportunity to just see a double image, there could be effects due to strings moving around the universe. And if you wanted to see that, you'd need to have some sort of nice continuous light source behind, such that you could keep watching that light source as the string is moving past. And a good example of the light source that we have is the microwave background radiation. So what would happen if a string like this passes in front of you and you're looking at the microwave background radiation? So you have something that's called the Kaiser-Stebbins effect. So this is the microwave background sky that's been enhanced by having a cosmic string through the middle of it passing along. Except in this picture, there is no cosmic string. G mu is zero. There's no energy per unit um, length. Now if I turn on some energy per unit length at a small level, this is 10 to the minus 8, you'll notice a slight difference. You'll notice, sorry about that, just notice that there's a slight shift behind compared to the front, a slight blue shifting of things, but it's not much. And that's because this is such a light cosmic string that the cone is very, very narrow. It's a very small effect. But I can artificially crank up how high this is. If you do that, you see quite quickly what happens. This is not that artificially cranked up. This is grand unified. So you see front, in front of the string, you get a red shifted effect. Behind, you get a blue shifted effect. It's going this way. That's because you're supposed to watch the screen. It goes that way. Yeah. yeah. So what that means is that, so another thing I should say, which I didn't prepare on a slide, is that not only does that happen to photons, but as a string were to pass, you'd expect matter to be pulled in behind it as well by that effect. There's a net force. So this is a way in which you could both form structure in the universe and form signatures in the microwave background of these strings. And people for a long time thought that this was a very promising uh, way to think about structure formation in the universe. And the main reason they thought it, well, not the main reason, but a large reason, as well as being in love with the idea of grand unification, is the idea that if you ask how heavy those strings have to be to give you the right sort of level of fluctuations in the structure in the universe and microwave background, the answer is they need to be gut scale. So they seem like the scale that you needed came out perfectly. If you look at the, what you need the energy break, the symmetry breaking scale to be, in order to get the right fluctuations in the matter density that grows into galaxies and things like that, the answer is the strings would need to be formed at the gut scale. That's a nice coincidence. It turns out not to be true, but it's a nice coincidence. Why is it not true? Well, we now know that strings cannot be the primary source of structure in the universe, and they cannot be the primary source of microwave anisotropies. And the reason we know it is that we now have exquisite data on the microwave background. So here is the power spectrum of the microwave background radiation. It's a function of, of uh, angular wave number. This, these, um, these are the actual data points. This is a fit to them. And this is the power spectrum you expect to get from strings. And it just doesn't work. This, this is a very, very precisely tested power spectrum these days. And the string power spectrum just doesn't work. And furthermore, if you go out into the universe and you measure the distribution of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and things like that, and you construct the power spectrum of matter fluctuations, say using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, then you get, again, so this is wave number in the universe versus power spectrum and large scale structure. You get a nice fall off like this in the data. And this is what you expect from strings. There's just no way you can make these things match. So this is known that it's not the way that this works anymore. Nevertheless, it's certainly still possible that strings play a subdominant role. After all, you saw on my last slide that if I just drop the energy density slightly, their effect on the microwave background is very much smaller. So it doesn't tell you strings aren't there. It tells you they're not the source of these fluctuations. Still, this is a good way of looking for strings. It just means they can't be the major source of fluctuations in the microwave background or the power spectrum of matter. Now, there's something else that can go on with strings that involves gravity, which is I showed you the strings getting chopped off the loop, net loop network and oscillating and radiating out their energy. In those simulations, what they're radiating off is scalar energy, scalar particles. 
But there's another thing that can happen, of course. After all, these are big, heavy objects, and they're moving around quite randomly, so they have a big quadrupole, so they can throw off gravitational waves. And in particular, there are two ways this can happen. String loops can just oscillate and release gravitational waves. All those cusps that I showed you can throw off gravitational waves as they relax back to the loop. And it turns out that this possibility is already constrained a lot by the timing of the millisecond pulsar. We know how, the pul how millisecond pulsars uh, behave very precisely. They're a very good test of any stochastic gravitational background in the universe. And we already know that there's not much room for a big stochastic gravitational background from strings. Okay. But cusps can emit gravitational waves in other particles, so it can be important. And one of the things that you would hope by building gravitational wave observatories like the LIGO one, which is here, is that it might give you an insight into this aspect of the early universe. LIGO itself is not sensitive enough, but it's possible that advanced LIGO and things like LISA would be sensitive to the gravitational waves produced by networks of cosmic strings. So what would happen, again, just to be clear, is that if you have some string like this that is oscillating away, then just the oscillations alone, you can compute what happens, and you'll find that these things radiate out energy this is the radiation pattern produced by that last oscillation. Radiate energy to infinity, and you can use simulations like this to compute the types of gravitational wave signatures you expect to be produced in uh, gravitational wave observatories. And then you can figure out how likely you are to be able to test ideas like this using the observatories we have planned. And it's known that, so here you have strain in an interferometer against, uh, against the power of uh, uh, um, uh, sorry against wave number uh, and what's happening is that you've got a contribution cusps a contribution what I call kinks I haven't written out the, the general background here over here you're ruled up by just cosmological bonds don't have too much cosmic uh, radiation at all and these are the bonds from LIGO 1 advanced LIGO should be able to probe here and Lisa should be able to probe all the way down here. So if you have a network of strings of a sufficiently high energy density, it's possible that gravitational wave observatories will give you an insight into them, although it's not guaranteed. What's Lisa? Lisa is the laser interferometric gravitational, uh, sorry, uh, laser interferometric, hmm. it's, it's, it's a gravitational wave detector in space. That space is, array. Space array, thank you. It doesn't. It will exist. Absolutely. Yes. Right. It's laser, I think. I don't think so. I know astronomers do do this, right? They have a lot of lodges and grates and varies, but I don't think it is large. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Right. These are things that are like a uh, you know million miles apart. These these uh, arms of this that are going to go around the sun, not around the Earth, in an orbit that's you know 30 degrees ahead of the Earth. Three spacecraft connected by lasers, a million miles apart, and they're going to detect deviations in the distances to, uh, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's an amazing world out there. It's an amazing world out there, Randy. You really should get out into it. There's lasers. It's incredible. It's just amazing. It is. It is. Like this. Like this. Say, look, you just moved, you, you just moved right now. <laughs> yeah. They, they bounce them back and forth. What's confusing you? <laughs> uh, don't ask me. Um, some point this decade, I believe, is the, is the whole. Yes. No, they're not radio. No, they're lasers. Right? Why, why would you want them to be radio? It's lasers. <laughs> so let me sort of finish up by mentioning one last gravitational possibility, since I'm going a little over time and I won't get to the stuff I wanted to say at the very end. Let me just take you back and say, so to undo one thing I told you, which was that the strings are abelian and they will intercommute. And in doing so, they will lose energy from the network, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What if they don't? What if they are non-abelian strings? If they're non-abelian, they can, instead of intercommuting, they'll get hung up on one another. And then they can form a, a network that's frustrated. It's like a big net. If you do that, then it's kind of interesting. If you want to know the effect on cosmology, then you have to average over the single string energy over all three spatial directions. Because after all, they'll be randomly oriented at different places in space. So if you 
if you go to the cosmological length scales, you have to average over that energy momentum tensor to allow for the strings that are facing in all different directions. So then you get an energy momentum tensor that looks like this. Now I'll take you back to the beginning of my talk, and I told you how perfect fluids with different equations of state affect the expansion of the universe. You'll see here that this is almost enough to cause the universe to accelerate. In fact, this is, if you t I take you back to that equation that I had, the acceleration equation, this is enough to cause the universe not to be decelerating and not to be accelerating, just to coast. And in fact, if I could do something like this with walls rather than strings, then I would have a two here, because there are two dimensions rather than one, and that would give you acceleration. So people have thought a little bit about whether you can use defects to actually get the universe to accelerate by frustrating them. It's a very hard thing to do well, but it's also kind of a cool thing, so I wanted to throw it in here. And it makes contact with uh, modern observations. So I had a few other things I wanted to say, but I've sort of reached the end of my time. So I think it's probably best if I let people get tea and ask me about this separately. Um, so maybe I'll just conclude, leave this slide up and conclude. So a lot of what, almost everything I've told you has, is very old stuff. I've been trying to sort of survey what people thought about when they started to think about topological defects in cosmology. It brings together a lot of field theory with a lot of relativity and a lot of, of cosmology that results from the general relativity. The reason people have started to care about these things again recently is that it's been realized that within string theory, you can also generate objects that are cosmic strings. So it's not that surprising. String theory contains within it field theory, and if strings are there in, in, uh, in uh, field theories, they should be there in string theory. What's the big deal? The big deal is that the interactions between these string theory cosmic strings, whether they intercommute or not, the probability is, f is less than one. I showed you that it always happens essentially for these abelian strings, and it doesn't happen for these non abelian ones. So these strings, it, the prob it has a probability, and it's not zero, and it's not one. And they can form junctions. So there's a much richer setup. And it allows the possibility that you might be able to observe the remnants of these stringy cosmic strings on the sky. And people have been putting quite a bit of work into trying to understand if it's possible to use the techniques I showed you, microwave background, looking for them as a subdominant component of the power spectrum, looking for them in gravitational waves, as a way to see if there are remnants of an early stringy phase in the universe that are sitting there today. So I don't have any time to tell you details about that, but it's definitely sort of a fun and very current direction to leave you with. So thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>